Uh, you see the text up here, Romans 12. Who's reading it? Rhonda Heiser's reading this, I think. Is that right? Is Rhonda here? Okay, thank you. Not yet. I'll give, some, I'll give you some set. But you can turn there on page 616. We're going to read it in just a moment. Um, hey, isn't that a worthy reason to postpone a Sunday school class for? Okay. We, do you remember the Sunday? He said, I don't know if we were talking about adoption or whatever that Sunday. And um, it was all stuck. You know, and we talked about, we prayed together, and then he gets a phone call this week, and God just moved it fast. So um, everything else is a wild card. Stay tuned. That class, I want to commend to you. And so you want to, I mean, it's really, really good. We're doing it on that camp, the Sawyer campus and this campus, and it's just been full. So um, when it happens, stay tuned, and we'll reconvene that. And Mike and I were talking after we got back from Haiti. He said, just, let's just postpone it, and we'll pick it back up. So. I also want to thank you for praying for the Haiti team. Uh, it, it was incredible. Uh, we had an equal number of people from both campuses there. And I don't know. They, it seems like they get better. This was the first time. Actually, I didn't see Lou today. Is he shell-shocked? Oh, there you are. Okay. Any Cubs fans here? Any Cubs fans? Okay. Just ask for the, the video where he gets a Haitian kid singing, Go Cubs Go. That was <laughs> even in Haiti. Um, this is the first time we did a team that was just our church. So it's good to include others. We've done, you know, other churches. There's a way we can have fellowship with other churches. But I'm telling you, it was just something even more precious being just our church. Uh, devotions were shared. I, I mean, I learned things about people I had not known. Um, yeah, we had Dick Hedman's 83 years old, and he comes with us. So we had young and old on it. It was, it was an absolute blast. So... Um, Somewhere there'll probably be some reports some other time. But I'm, I've actually, so I'm studying this text. And, um, and we were praying for you every day. Uh, in a little bit, we can get emails. So we're praying for Tony Rutson and his surgery was, was ongoing. Uh, Jim Lundin on the other campus has some things. Sandy Baker, who's got treatment started this week. Just we're back and forth praying. And, I, I f and praying for Bruce. Um, I felt like, Watching and being with our brothers and sisters in Haiti and being with his team and, and studying this in afternoon spots that I was experiencing what this text says and watching it all while studying it. So I'm, I'm hoping as we go through this, um, we will be able to worship with it and be listening in a way that God would, would move us that way. So let me review some context and then Ron is going to come up and read. Um, this is the book of Romans. Again, this is a book, um, I should say, this is to a church that Paul had not yet been to. So typically of the apostle's pattern when he writes to a church, his beginning portion, he's writing of God's grace. And I want to say to you, everything in our life should be seen through the lens of God's grace, as Romans is. And then he tends to address issues in the church. Well, many of the letters are are specific problems in those churches because they're churches that Paul planted. He knows the people well. Romans, he hasn't been to yet. So what's unique in Romans, if it's 16 chapters, 11 chapters are on God's grace. It's robust. So we've been going through that for uh, four or five weeks. I just commend that to your own reading and so forth. But we, we traveled through it fairly fast. But it's he then addresses things to the church. You can't understand the church if we don't understand God's grace. And so when we get to these chapters, it's really, um, particularly chapter 12, but all these chapters, it's really how to be the church. But you can't understand how to be the church without understanding God's grace. It affects everything. So last week's passage, which we're going to actually read verses, we're going to start from verse 1, Rhonda, with the reading. Okay? So we're going to start with 1, because that's, that's the 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 strong turning point in this book as, as it does so. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Oh, I should say this. So while these letters were written to specific churches, they, that letter would be to that church, but it would travel amongst the churches. God intended it to that way. He intended also that this would be preserved as Scripture, as His Word, so that we would be admonished by it as well. And that's how we should receive it. So Rhonda, come and read. Do we have a microphone for her? Okay. So th this is Romans chapter 12. It's fine. Yep. 
verses 1 to 8. You know, I bet if I took mine off, it would help. <laughs> Is this like Saturday Night Live or something? I don't know. Is there a ca secret camera? Let's try it that way. Does that work? Good. I'll sit here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesy, proph I can't do that, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Thank you. Thanks. You can take that with you. Thank you. Go ahead and give it to Mike. Let's pray. Father, this is your word, and it is your word to us today. So we pray this. We pray that you would help us to receive it as from you. And you're the one that knows each person here. You know if there's anyone that is yet to yield their life to you. And God, if that's so, I pray that your spirit would work in that way. You know those of us what we struggle with, where we need to be convicted, where we need you to move in our life, and we're asking for that today. Do that as you wish. We ask, we pray, and let us receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So sometimes I try to summarize what's taking place in the text, and this is one of my, this is at least one attempt to do it, but I'd, I'd say the main idea is this, that God gave gifts to each of his people that are to be used for his glory and for the strengthening of the body of Christ. So you have the dimension of what God has done giving to us and using in this aspect towards him and towards one another. Um, so what I want to do is make some comments and go back to verses 1 and 2. Mike preached wonderfully last week here, as Rob did on the Sawyer campus. But if we take verses 3 through 8 and we disconnect them from the first two verses, we really miss the point of that. So the book has a major uh, change in turning here um, in terms of what he's saying, but it's driven through those first two verses. So just by way of review, I'm going I'm to go through this. There, there's a particular motivation for our life and for our action and, and so he makes this appeal based upon God's mercies to us. We have, if you belong to Christ, we have experienced the very mercies of God. Um, I'm looking. Mark Beneclausen was with us. Is he in here? There. Mark gave a devotion last week when we were in Haiti. It was very interesting. He was reflecting back actually on Romans 9 and reflecting back particularly on that um, statement in there quoted from the book of Exodus, that God will have mercy upon whom God will have mercy. He just does. He chooses where that will be placed. And so we reflected in that morning, as we should here, that we've received God's mercy. And that should be the kind of thing that creates, in a sense, all in our life. Why did I receive God's mercy? What does that mean? That there's this awareness and embracing of what has actually taken place. So let me say this to you in a slightly different way. We should remember God's mercies to us every single day. Every single day. 
And that will have a great effect on us. It will have a great and practical effect on us. Let me say it a different way. There should not be a day that we go through forgetting God's mercy. So let me just ask you that. Are you aware of God's mercy to you? Are you aware of that? Do you think about it? Do you think about it much? Such should be the way of God's people. It will keep us living in a, a particular direction toward God Himself. It will be the kind of thing that will change it, will make our hearts, we, we will be thankful people. Oh, being aware of God's mercy will put today's problems within their proper perspective. Being aware of God's mercy will be the kind of thing that makes us humble. It will be the kind of thing that makes us forgive as we consider unimaginable forgiveness of God. Being aware of God's mercy will also make us merciful and kind towards others. Last week, so besides teaching the different church leaders, there was preaching in the evening, a little more than I had earlier anticipated, so depending on God for various messages, but one of the messages that was, there was some reflection on David's life and Saul's life, and I was reminded there that David, early in his life, speaks out of God's mercy to him. He was in a humble place, but there's a day as he ascends, there's a day when he forgets, and it didn't happen in just a day. And his choices therein are great. The effect of that sin was great. Being aware of God's mercy daily, often around us. It keeps us from sin. That's part of the verse 2. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. So there's a way in which we as God's people, we are swimming against the stream. That's what we're doing. We are going against the current of our culture. And aware of God's mercy causes us then to offer up ourselves to God so that we recognize life isn't about me. It's about Him. It causes us to risk for God's glory. That's what evangelism is. That's what missions is. That's what's, Whenever you invite someone with you to church, there's a sense of risk. When you serve someone, there's a sense of risk. There's lots of ways to do that, but it's because I'm not viewing life as about me. It's about Him. It's a way of offering ourselves up to God, the Savior, our Savior, the Son, Jesus. That's what he did. He left, put aside his prerogatives. He risked, he gives up his life. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to, to give up his life as a ransom payment for us. That's the way we're called that's his verse 1, and he says there, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. What's that mean? Well, always living means always offering ourselves up to God. That is, it's, it's, a, it's a continual thing because we're alive. It's not one and done. It's continually tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, Tuesday morning. To, we're, we're offering ourselves up to God, and it's sacrifice. It's always sacrifice. I mean, essentially the call when Jesus calls us to follow him, it's what? It's this. Oh, new cross. Wonderful. Did Dwayne do this? Who did this? Did he? Oh, and is he gone now? Oh, I like that. So do you know why we have a cross here? It just reminds us. Okay, it just, it just reminds us of what's central. Our Savior died. You know, this is a place of execution. It, it's become a religious symbol. You know, people wear it. It's jewelry. No, it isn't. That, that's like seeing the guillotine or that's like seeing the electric chair. Is that a symbol of worship? Yes. That's where our Savior died. That's what he calls us to. We, we die to self. It's actually in the dying to ourself and receiving him, we receive his life. Forgiveness takes place there. Substitution. Our sin is transferred to him. His righteousness is transferred to us. That, that's why it's up here, to remind us all the time. Every single part of Scripture somehow runs through that event. That's why it's here. We do have it in mobile fashion, which I just prefer. It could be attached, but I just prefer it so it can be here. And I kind of wanted it closer to the guy who's preaching rather than further back, but that's preference, but that's why. 
It's here. He tells us to offer of ourselves as a living sacrifice, to not deny ourselves. That the first will be last, and the last will be first. So this paragraph, it is a reorienting paragraph in the way we need to think, in the way we need to think about our lives, the way we need to think about God, the way we need to think about the church. So that's verses 1 and 2 in some way which sets up verses 3 through 8. So the rest of this chapter, I would say, in some ways, is really about how to be the church. So he speaks of it in various ways, but God's mercy should affect how we think about the church. Presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to God should be how we think about the church. So let me describe um, a couple of expressions that are more our culture's way of thinking not a biblical way of thinking. So I'm going to back up. What did I just say? How we think about church is affected by God's mercy and being a living sacrifice. Let's put that over here by this side. Here's the other side. Here's our culture. Uh, let's go to church today. Let's go to church. Like church is an event. Now we've probably all said that. I'm not criticizing somebody. I'm just, but it's a mentality. Let's go to church today. Or saying, what did you get out of church today? So I'm just telling you, they wouldn't say that in the New Testament. It's not how, church is us. So the church gathers here today. It's significant to gather on Sunday morning. So we're gathered here and we're dispersed the rest of the week. We are the church. Church is people, not building. It's, it's this together. It's actually, we'll see it in the text, that we're called the body of Christ. It's a living organism in which the Holy Spirit works through. Something significant in this gathering, but we don't go to church and get something out of church. We are, and I would say to you, God is present, and we do receive from Him, but there's receiving and giving, there's serving within when we come, which is later in the text. It's just a different mentality. Those two phrases tend to be more self-centered, me-centered, or I would say more consumer, consumerism, like a consumer, that's our culture. That's not, that's not the way they would understand church. So we're all affected by culture. I am. So trying to, to think biblically, is, it, it's, it's an exercise. And I'm helped by brothers and sisters just as we talk through things. But that's, that's a different way. So... I would say to you that it's not popular today to be committed to a local church. It just isn't. I was at a, um, attending a national conference about a month ago. Um, a lot of really good churches. I was in a cohort with churches about our size, about two, uh, 25 pastors, every single one. Oh, so we're supposed to talk about, hey, what are significant issues you want to deal with? I'm just listening because I'm like, I got so many issues. You're talking about me personally? You're talking about me in my church? So they put them up on this whiteboard. Every single person said this. How do you do Sunday mornings? How do you have community in Sunday mornings? So I was surprised. And this is people from all over the nation, but they're, they're talking about um, the pattern, which I've read nationally, um, that people who say they're committed to church, th that they attend on a Sunday morning about once a month. And they're, and they're, just, they're wrestling as pastors. How do you create community? How do you... How do you teach how, how do you do what you're supposed to do as the church was was their question so all i'm trying to address is culture oh i got i got to pause i got to add a disclaimer so i want to be faithful to the text so those of you who are feeling guilty and think you're t i'm t that i'm talking about you that's not what i'm 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 trying to be faithful to the text but i i want to speak about our culture's drift and about what god calls us to and those opportunities so I will be strong, but I don't have anybody in mind, unless I have myself in mind, because I, I, I recognize that all this stuff, okay? So I just want to make, make that clear. But I, do, I, I talk with a lot of people, places. There is, we recognize, a competition for Sunday morning. There's a competition that did not exist 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So I'm going to get to this later, but I would say that gives us a greater opportunity, because Everybody went once upon a time. Now they don't, so there's an opportunity for us, okay? But we have this competition to deal with. It's, it's also popular for people who identify themselves as Christian to be more private about their worship. And I've had conversations with people where I, I, well, I do this on the internet, or I, 
you know, I do this here or whatever. And uh, some, one of the other um, real strong movements right now is I'm going to do this with this small group of people. This is, this is my church. I, I'm, the org- organized church has got problems. Yep, because it's got people. It's got problems. So, I, man, I don't disagree with them, but they say this. And I would just say in the New Testament, I think the pattern is both large and small. Both things happening. I, I think being part of a small group fellowship is important, but I wouldn't say that's a reason to, to reject the larger gathering and for people to have conflicts or reasons not to. That, that's common. We're, we're, that's, it's common. But it should be both. We just live in this really weird, rare time and rare country. Because the church in America really, we haven't really s- experienced persecution like the church historically, internationally. And it does. Persecution has a, has a strange way of cleansing the church, of making differences shrink. That preferences and things don't matter. The conflict with that, I, I need to resolve that conflict. I, And we haven't had that. So people make other choices because we really are very individualistically motivated. All of us are. I am. We are more self-centered than God-centered. We've got to recognize about that. We've got to repent of that. We've got to do what Scripture calls us to. So let me put up a little outline here. I'm kind of suggesting that the rest of um, 12 is how to be the church with one another. These verses, 3 through 8, are really going to be about using gifts to serve the church. And then next week will be about an attitude um, to serve a church, or it actually goes outside the church in a couple of verses. But I just say it's a, it's a serving attitude um, in general. So that's a bit of an outline. And what I'm suggesting still in this introduction, that there is a different, the, the Word of God is calling us to a different mentality than our culture. And we need to be there. So life is not about me. It's about living as if I belong to God. Because I do. And that has effect in the church. Here's verse 3. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but with sober judgment. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 has a very similar phrase. It's actually calling out uh, the person of Jesus as he left aside and how he suffered. And it, and it says to us in the church, it says, Consider others as more significant than yourself. Consider them as more significant than yourself. Don't think of others, of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but with sober judgment. How high is too high? What's he saying to us? Think of others as more significant than yourself. I feel like I watched this all last week. I watched it all last week. I would, I would travel with a group from this church anywhere. I, I feel like I just, I'm blessed whenever I get to be with our people someplace out of a different context. Watching them serve together. Watching them love on brothers and sisters in Haiti. Watching them serve underneath them. Um, so the guys are doing these certain, there's, there's I think there's always a hundred projects to fix. So I decided not to put up any pictures today because I thought it'd be distracting. So I, but. Someone will do it another time, but pictures of, of Mark and Bob working together. Mark is, he is, I don't know what the word is. I was thinking of a stubborn resilience. You, you, a person, you can't, if you give, got a job to do, and there's a problem, you can't get him off it till it's done. He's going to make sure it gets done, and he's doing it to, to fix th- things that were significant. Bob, there's not a man I know more positive than Bob Heiser. You know, everything's yes, we can do everything, you know, and I mean, these guys make, when you're, when you're on a team, and I'm doing, I'm doing teaching, you know, like, how hard is that? So I'm teaching. They, they make it a joy. I get this. Oh, here's one. So I, I've done this a couple times with these guys, and, and they're not, um, so this congregation would be more literate than this group of church leaders. They're, their reading level is just different. So think how hard it is to learn when you're listening, and it's translation. So I needed a whiteboard. They don't have a whiteboard out there. So I write one guy on Thursday, I said, man, why don't you, um, Rick Blake, because he's in, got an automation company, I said, you guys should invent like a portable whiteboard. He's in California, he's like, eh, it's on Amazon, and you can get it tomorrow. And you're like, unbelievable. So I order them. There's these rolled up things, okay? 
these little tubes. They came to my house, and so, but they got like, stick. how are you going to fix these? How, there's nothing to put them on. They got, there's no plywood. There's no way to attach them. Bob just goes, just leave it to me. I got it. So he asked pastor's permission. They got like the thing drilled with cement anchor, anchors, you know, and I could never think through this concrete block wall. They got it all up there. I cannot tell you how that helped our training all week long. It's visual. And we refer to certain, I mean, it just, it, it made it. It wasn't twice as good. It was 10 times as good. The retention, what went back and forth. Because of that kind of a serving gift. I watched Ann Stewart, who Ann's always, Ann is one of the most gifted serving leaders I know. I'm admonished by watching her. There's a particular thing we, that, Lou had talked with Pastor Jean-Claude that we could do in the nutrition centers, had the idea. He basically just turfed it. No, he tried to turf it to me, and I'm like, I look like a deer in headlights. Uh, yeah. So that was the point where he decided to turf it to somebody else who was a lot better at this. Sends it to Anne. She goes into south side of Chicago with a ministry that we got a relationship with, learned how they do some things, brought it back, had Elaine Priest and uh, Sarah Timrick, trained it there. They're, they're working with like these just post-high school Haitian kids with them in the mornings, how they were going to add not just scripture memory and things, but what does this verse mean? And worked it through with them in the mornings. The, the youth taught them in the afternoons. And I'm telling you, the Haitian kids, they were they're just glued to, to older Haitian brothers and sisters, to mentors. But they did, I'm looking at that, and I'm just in awe. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Oh, so I'm teaching this group of church leaders Monday through Thursday. Who's the big deal here? I'm teaching them how to study Scripture. Who's the big deal there? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I watch some things happen. There's some times with tears. So um, we're studying one passage. We're trying to look for the word believe in the text. So I was just doing basically, um, it's the Bible reading skills that actually Mike's been doing, some of them, in, in the Sunday school class, which I would commend to you. And so we're doing it there. Um, and some of them, I should tell you about this, this group. I, I didn't have any pictures. So there's various levels of literacy. And there was one church, well, a bunch of the churches that came from the mountains. Mountains is more remote than city people. So city people, better education. Mountains, less educated. There was some sweet Dear ladies that, I don't know any other word to say, they just looked decrepit. I mean, they looked, I have no idea how old they were, but they were just small and shriveled. They were there. And so um, they'd never been to the class before. Many had, some of them didn't read. They'd never been taught to read. So think about what we have. I mean, we have actually, Rhonda read out of a, a different translation. We have multiple English versions for us. The word of God and reading it's so important. How do you learn if you don't read? So most, there's a whole, big portion of the world's that way, by the way. So verbal preaching is very important and preaching it accurately, but they're in the class. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. So who's the big deal here? I watched it. I watched as we're going through one portion, a guy make a discovery about a particular word I'd never seen before. And he's just like, I said, I, I've never seen that at the end. And we were, we, were, we were enjoying that together. It was the whole thing, scripture discovery. And we talked about that in that moment. I watched students, you know, they're, they're not used to circling words, doing that. And here, here was the real moment. And all the guys on the team would say this. Um, we had, so we had uh, revival meetings at night. I'm preaching. But I'm telling you, when that group, that little mountain group of women got down there and sang, and they sang, there wasn't like any question who trusted God more. This guy or them? Who loved God with all of their heart, soul, strength, and mind? I watched them. I, I, I get t my eyes are full of tears different times. Actually, when we finished all our teaching sessions, I just said, hey, how can I pray for you? They asked how they could pray for me. That's, I was just meaning to ask it. And then they start praying. They drop to their knees and they're praying. I didn't. Then they get up and they sing. And they're like singing all over the place. And then they started pray, praying like, now it was exhortational prayer. Now they're like 
they're going and praying these things. They're like, I'm watching them. Who's being taught here? Who's being instructed? What things do we depend on? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. You know what I thought? Treasure in heaven is immense for those brothers and sisters. They understand things we don't understand. And every single person on the team would say, we received more. Why is that written? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. We tend to compare ourselves with others. It's just plain wrong. We do it all the time. That's not to do. They, they were tempted to do that too. I mean, you know, um, it's the Peter and John thing at the ends of, end of um, Gospel of John. Peter wants to know, hey, what's going to happen to that guy? If this is going to happen to me, what's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, it's, not, it's none of your business, basically. It, we don't have to. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. We're to serve in any area that we can, not thinking too much of ourselves. He uses this phrase, according to the measure of the grace that God has assigned. According to the measure of the grace that God has assigned. Oh, do you mean like God has assigned to each person a certain measure of grace? That's what that appears. I don't know the recipe. But he's, he's put his grace in various amounts to various people. So I take that to mean I'm not to compare myself with anyone else. I am, but I am to serve, offering myself as a living sacrifice. Verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Pause before five. He's talking about a body. So that's, that's the word in the New Testament. There's many words for church. Sometimes it calls us the bride of Christ, which is very interesting. But one of the terms we use around here a lot is the body, meaning the body of Christ. So he's using an example, as he does in 1 Corinthians 12, that likens the church to members of a actual body. So let me ask you this. What part of your face would you like to do without? My son always does this. Would you rather? They're like impossible options, you know. <laughs> would you rather this or that? What part is more important than the others? Well, I'm supposing, you know, if you did that around the dinner table, you could rank them, I suppose. But that's not the point of this. Here's the point. If you're missing a part, you miss it. If you can't see, you miss that. If you can't hear, you miss that. Smell, taste. It's not which part's more important than the other. Which part would you like to do without? That's not what he's saying. These all work together. They, they are all important. Just as the body is one and has many parts to do different work in order for the body to function well, verse 5, so we, though we are many people, we are one in the body of Christ individually, members of one another. I didn't get this. So if I was in my Bible, one of the phrases I got circled there is individually members of one another. It's a really interesting phrase. I actually I try to use it in, in the text. That if he's going, so if you take verses one and two, in a sense, we belong to God, right? And here, individually members of one another, because we belong to God then we also belong to one another. That's actually very radical. Okay? I would say it's absolutely un-American. It's not how people think about the church. We belong to each other. So now, let me describe what that might mean in some ways. Okay? So I'm going to contrast that phrase. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love that. I paused because I thought of how many more things I need you to correct, but I won't tell you about that. Individually members of one another. <clears throat> Sorry, my mind goes. We belong to each other. Think of that in contrast to our culture that says, hey, I went to church, what did you get out of church? It's not, that's not it. It's not this little Sunday deposit, did my thing, and now I go off and live my life. It's not that. I get my little spiritual dose. No, no, we belong to each other. The church is the body of Christ. We're actually connected. We're, we belong to God so daily sacrifice, offering myself and to each other, which is, that's, that's the orientation of these particular verses. So let me give some, some, some ways of thinking of that. That means that my decisions affect you. That is, how I live, how I give, how I use my time 
my choices, it actually does affect my brothers and sisters. And how you live, how you give, how you use your time, the choices you make affects me and the brothers and sisters around here. So, if I live independent of the body, it affects the whole body of Christ. That's a pretty different way to think about the church, isn't it? If I make decisions that don't consider the body of Christ, it does affect the body of Christ. Conversely, now let me flip it the other way. If I make decisions considering the effect on the body of Christ, the body's blessed, it's well nourished, it, it, it flourishes. And we know that in the church. We've experienced that in the church a lot. And I'll say this later. Okay, final section. Employ your God-given gifts with your best effort. Yeah, did you make this clear? Do you guys have this scripture? Because I'd like to read. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I, I put in there, um, the, the, the subtitle for this was Employ Your God-Given Gifts with Your Best Effort. Here's what he says. Um, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So if I got my Bible, the phrase I'm underlining is the let us use them. That's the, that's the driving verb, the driving action in this. Let us use them. And then he goes on and gives some examples. So if it's prophecy in proportion to our faith, if it's service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes, do it with generosity, the one who leads, do it with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, do it with cheerfulness. So some of those have a qualifier. If this is your gift, do it this way. Um, the operative word is use them. Now, let me, let me ask you a different question. This was really popular when I was a kid. How many of you ever seen a thing or done a thing that, that was like how to discover your gifts? How many of you ever, part- raise your hands, so I just get, okay, some. How many have no clue of that? Don't even know what I'm talking about? Okay, good, you're in better shape. Um, <laughs> so um, this was really popular a while ago, like discover your gift, you need to know it. Can I just tell you, I don't think the New Testament church was doing that. I don't, I don't think that was a deal. So let me argue it for a couple of things. One is, um, that list of gifts there, it's not exhaustive. You can, go to, you can go to different places in the Bible that list different gifts. It's just not, ex- there's no place that says this is the list of all the gifts. So discover what you see, which ones yours match up in. Um, it's interesting, in the New Testament, there's some that are left off from the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament speaks about um, music and instrument and craftsmanship. I can't do this. Craftsmanship. And talks about people doing that in a way they were filled with the Spirit. It's differing gifts. So follow me. I'm not actually convinced that every gift God gave is listed in the Bible. That's not the point. So when we go discover your gift, I want to suggest to you that that also is more driven by our culture, a meism, a self-centeredness, and whatever. The emphasis on Scripture is use them. How can I use them if I don't know what it is? I'm sorry. How hard is it to figure out how to serve? It's not really that hard to figure out like there's a need someplace and to serve. So I I think it's great if you have a sense of who you are, how God's made you to be, okay? I'm not saying that's bad. It's the emphasis, and I I find that helpful in, in figuring out my strengths and weaknesses, actually. But... The emphasis in Scripture is God's given you this. And he's distributed how... We don't look at each other and compare. Just use them. The body's better when we use them. If you're, not, if you're not serving and using them, the body's not as strong as it could be. It could be stronger. He's talking about a local church, friends. He's about this church. So when the Scripture's writing this, it does refer to the church universal, but every letter is addressed to a local gathering of God's people. So it's... That's true here. All right. And only because I'm running late. Anne had a devotion, 1 Peter 4.10. I, I didn't have the verse up here. She had a devotion last week. It was so much this. It speaks of God's grace. I'm going to read it. It was just good because it was Anne. Anne sharing this to our team last week in Haiti, and I go, oh, that is the text. Only it's Peter. You probably got it up there before I got it, did you? Race. I got her. Okay. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Same operative thing. Not just use it to serve one another 
as good stewards of God's varied grace. It speaks again. It's from God's grace. It's very, that's the very clear emphasis of Scripture. So let me be practical. I don't know how you view church, but I'd say to you that being part of the church called the body of Christ is an amazing privilege. It comes from realizing God's mercy. And I want to be clear on this. I'm going to say some things strongly, but I love this church. I love God's people. I see this happening in you. So when I say it strongly, it's not because I don't see it. I think the text says it strongly, and I think our culture is going a different way. So that's why I'm going to say it strongly. But I could use dozens. I, I could talk for an hour on all the ways I see it, particularly in life groups, the ministry you've been to the Rutzen family, the ministry to, to Sandy and Jeff Baker, um, the ministry when, when, when relationships blow up, people bringing people into their homes, the accountability provided. I mean, it's, it's I love Anytime I can talk about how God's working amongst you, I love it because I see it all over. But the culture goes the other way. So I'm concerned about the church in our culture. I'm concerned about it passing on to the next generation. I love how Tana shows up at all kinds of things and serves places. Like a funeral. Did, I didn't even know you knew that. I mean, just, so I see it in young and old. But there's more. So I know I'm affected by our culture. I know you are. So... Being part of his church called his bride, it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. So I just want to ask you this. I want to challenge the way we may be affected by culture. How do you view the church? Do you view it like the Bible speaks of it? Or have you been affected by our culture? People have a lot of commitments and church is not a strong one. It's important, but... So our culture didn't used to compete with Sundays. Now it does. So everybody used to go to church. Or, or we, we, we left space for it. Now that's not true. What I want to say to you is that leaves us with a great opportunity to go against the flow, to go against our culture. Because our culture's schedules conflict with Sunday morning. So we have a great opportunity to actually be different for some, it's like when something competes with it, we just acquiesce. It just is. And I, and everybody I know, eight, when I talk to 80-year-olds, they say they're busier now than they used to be. Okay, Everybody I know is busier now than they used to be. Is there anybody who's not busier now than they used to be? Everybody I know. There's one. Thank you. <laughs> Probably by intention. By intention? Somewhat. I, to, to get less busy generally takes choices that I'm going to do these things that God's done and not, I'm not going to, because there's so many opportunities and things that come to us all the time. So it was one. It's a rare one, and that's, that's right. Uh, I was talking with someone very recently that said it this way. Uh, I do counseling inside of the church, and they just said, I know when it all started going wrong for me, and their life's a disaster right now. They just said, it's, it's when we, we started getting disengaged from the church. And I wasn't asking about that. They just, they just said it. So, um, yeah, i got a couple other things. Let me think how to do this. Let me say it this way. Here's something that's different in our culture that they didn't have to deal with in the New Testament. That there are multiple churches in a given area that you can go to. And you can have a degree of fellowship with Christians from other churches. I do. I mean, I, I try to encourage pastors in our community. So that's, that's a good thing, but I want to suggest to you that there is a priority of fellowship with the people that God has joined you with, that you worship with, that you served with. We definitely experience that in Haiti, a team like that. My word is there's a priority of fellowship with that. So the church is gathered now. It disperses later. It's all the church. So I just want to say to you, I'm going to talk about Sunday morning for a moment and then leave you really with following up on, on the way you would take this. Sunday morning's a gift, and we all have gifts. We have something to bring here. I would say to you, use them. Where can you use that here? There's lots of things that could be done. There's room for you. You may think because someone else is doing something, there's not room for you. I know there's room right down in that room. <laughs> I know. I, oh. So what I, this is just a personal desire for me do you know who's not in this room michelle it's nice to see you 
You know who's often not in this room? It's someone like Michelle because she's in there with the kids. It's the moms who end up being in there in the most. Not, not just them. There's other ones too. Is Christine in here today? Yeah, Christine's fine. Okay, Christine's out there a lot. I love it. There's more. We can rotate it. Yeah, that's a good, so they can be in here. It'd be great to have people out in the parking lot greeting. Or you just talk about all kinds of ways to, to do that. I'd, have, I'd love to have, well, I got kids. I'd love to have kids with you being a greeter there, handing out the worship guides. What a, what a great way to teach our kids what's important is that we get to serve together. These, they're, they're just opportunities. I would suggest to you that whether you have a job to do or not, a particular assignment, that here's one thing I know to be true. Every Sunday that we gather, there's someone that needs encouragement. <laughs> Many someones that needs to be listened to. That needs to be, hey, how you doing? And actually stays to listen. That could be before, that could be after. There'll be moments when you'll know when God prompts it, it might be a moment when you could pray with them. Every Sunday, there's lots of people like that. What if when we walk in, we've read through the text, we're looking for God, and we're praying, God, who do you want me to talk with today? I know one person that never comes in without praying, God, where do you want me to sit that way? Those are just examples of the way God moves through the body, and we didn't even begin talking about when we're dispersed. Hey, Lord, so you've, you've been reading, you're fed by the word, and now you're thinking about the people God's joined you to or the people that don't know him yet. God, who? You're driving, you turn off the radio, and you just ask him. And not when you're driving, when you stop. Maybe that's the text you shoot to somebody, the phone call you make, the visit you make. Those are serving each other with gifts however it is. Here's what I love that for Converge Community Church to come away with from this. God's done much, and he's not done. We are aware of God's mercy, so much so that we would think about it daily and throughout the day. And in a way of offering up ourselves, it's not about me, it's about him, we'd be asking him about how that gets to go on a Sunday, how that gets to go today. And then we'd be responding to him in that way for the glory of God and the nourishment of the body of Christ. And that, my friends, that's the church. Not showing up for an hour and a half on a Sunday, which is still a good thing, but it's more. Let's pray. Pro Father, there's this, this thing that we know about us that we tend to see from our own perspective, mostly. And we ask that you would change that. That if there's places you would wish to correct, that you would actually confront it and we'd repent of it. There's places that you would move us toward that we haven't even thought of. But God, in whatever way, it'd be done in such a way that your people love you more. It's not done out of duty and compulsion but our moving towards one another and those who don't know you yet is moved because of your mercies to us. But that's the, that's the thing that's in our minds and hearts all the time. Thank you, O oh Christ, for leaving your throne in heaven for a season, for humbling yourself, to taking human flesh, being restricted in some sense, and dying a humiliating death for us. God, reorient our lives so it's about you and not about us in all kinds of ways that brings joy to your people and spreads the glory of Christ in all kinds of ways around this city, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.